Good evening and welcome to the historic Wayne Theater Ross Performing Arts Center. Thank you so much for joining us for our signature speaker series for science. We are so excited to join with the Virginia Natural History Museum and have Joe Kuiper here tonight to introduce our speaker. We, coming up at the Wayne Theater, we will be have, celebrating the decade of the 70s on the last Saturday of March with Jimmy Overton. And we will be showing it right here live in-house. He'll be live on stage. And we will also be showing it virtually through our Facebook and YouTube channel. Please check out all that we have going on at waynetheater.org. And we thank you for joining us this evening. Joe. Good. Thank you, Tracy. Wow, this is great. This uh, image here makes me uh, realize that April's right around the corner and some greenery is going to be coming out. So I'm totally psyched about that. So uh, as Tracy said, I'm Joe Kuiper, director of the Virginia Museum of Natural History. It's great to be back at the Wayne Theater with the signature series. I'm sorry, signature speaker series. It's been a very successful um, run so far. And it's um, my pleasure to, uh, to say that uh, this could not be made possible without the South River Science Team. Uh, they've been sponsoring this event all year. And uh, to make it kind of exciting, uh, thanks to our colleagues at the Center, of Col Center for Cold Waters Restoration, who have been incredibly just um, so helpful with this process of the Virginia Museum of Natural History, making its effort to establish its first permanent branch here in Waynesboro, just a short distance from the Shenandoah National Park. Um, they have... Uh, just uh, have, have done so much for us. And, uh, and, and with that, I, I just want to make sure that they are acknowledged as well for everything they've put uh, into uh, the work that we've done here. So, uh, so where do we stand these days with, uh, with our project, right? Well, we know that uh, COVID put a lot of things on hold, um, and, uh, you know, but uh, we, we kept kind of pushing along. Going back before uh, the pandemic, we had uh, completed our pre-planning study, which is state speak for kind of a, a portion of your planning that involves both developing your exhibit narrative, but also the basic foundational look of what your building's gonna look like. So for those of you who might be new, whether you're here in person or online tonight, uh, just down the hill from the theater right here in downtown Waynesboro, next to uh, Constitution Park, we intend to put approximately a 30,000 square foot facility that will mainly be dedicated to education classrooms and public exhibits. So during this theme, with the help of the Center of Cold Waters Restoration, we came up with a theme of speakers that would follow essentially the themes of our exhibit narrative that we came up with during the pre-planning. And so that's what we're gonna be continuing tonight. So we've had talks on invertebrates of the Shenandoah Valley and Blue Ridge. We've had talks regarding evolutionary processes, mountaintops as islands of biodiversity and so forth, and a number of other topics, including the geology and hydrology, which of course this area is so rich in. So with that help from Center for Cold Waters Restoration leading up to tonight, we have this great theme going and we're gonna continue be with this uh, topic that you hear tonight. And it's gonna be something that we would really like to feature in our exhibits. So just getting back to what I said before, where do we stand? I'm pleased to say that at this point, thanks to uh, our um, uh, local Senator, uh, Senator Hanger, uh, we are continuing to be uh, included within the budget for the state of Virginia. And as we stand now, the governor is gonna review the budget in April. And uh, uh, we hope that we will continue to be included at that point. Um, and what that would do, if we are successful and remain there, we will move into a phase called detailed planning. This is a regimented 18 month process that develops all the information that you need to turn your project essentially into blueprints that you give to a contractor. So uh, the next two years, starting July 1st, really stands to be a very exciting time. We wanna engage the community continually during that time period, not just with the technical expertise, but also with educators and people who are enthusiasts for natural history. So uh, please keep your fingers crossed for us. Please talk to uh, your local legislators. If you uh, feel that this is a project that's good for the community, we think it will be. It's not just good for our, for our museum, but we think it's gonna be good for this local community, the regional area, as well as the state of Virginia 
in total. So uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce tonight's speaker, and we'll get on with this, uh, this theme that follows and parallels our exhibit narrative very nicely. So we have Kip Muma t tonight. Uh, Kip is a, the principal engineer at Ecosystem Services, which is a small business that uh, he and a colleague had started in 2011. So they're a team of scientists and engineers that are primarily involved in stormwater management and ecological restoration. So as you see with tonight's talk, we're going to be hearing about stream restoration in the Shenandoah Valley. Incidentally, um, just uh, proud to say that uh, uh, Kip uh, you know, was originally from Floyd and got his uh, Bachelor of Science in Environmental Eng Engineering from Virginia Tech. So it's great to have that, uh, that local talent translate into something that uh, I think will be very inspiring for all of us tonight. So Kip, we'll go ahead and turn the stage over to you. So please give a welcome to Kip Muma. All right, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you, Tracy, as well, and thanks to the Wayne uh, Theater and Virginia Natural History Museum for the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. It sounds like um, already done a lot of great topics, and so if you've um, been following along with those, I think that we'll touch on a lot of those different uh, topics tonight as well in the context of, of stream restoration. Um, so. In, in general, what we're gonna try and cover is uh, why are we restoring streams and then how do we restore streams? So it's a fairly simple uh, idea, but as you'll, you'll see, um, there's a lot of detail that, that we can go into with these questions. And the context for tonight's talk is gonna be the Shenandoah Valley. And so if you can see here in, in yellow, we're gonna, since we're talking about streams and rivers, we're gonna define the Shenandoah Valley um, by the drainage basin. So this is the drainage basin of the Shenandoah River. And then um, as is usually done, we tag along the, the Opaquan here as well um, because uh, geologically and, and culturally, uh, it also has a lot of the same characteristics of the Shenandoah Valley. And so this, this covers Augusta County um, to the south here, uh, Rockingham County, uh, Page on the east side of, the, of um, Massanutten and um, uh, Shenandoah County, and then we also have Warren C County, Clark County, and Frederick towards the towards the north. So um, we're all fairly familiar um, with the geography here, and and for most of the statistics and and numbers that I'll be talking about. Uh, we'll be using this geographic area uh, for, for the context of that conversation. So in total, we're, we're um, about 3,400 square miles uh, is the drainage area um, down to where the, um, the Shenandoah joins the Potomac. And so uh, 3,400 square miles. So now within this area, um, counting kind of the larger stream systems, we're talking about 7,000 miles of, of stream. And so we're fairly rich in, in streams in this area. So if you take, um, think of that in just looking at this map here, we have about 140 miles is, is uh, our length here. And so we could go back and forth here 50 times and that's about the length of, of streams that we're, we're talking about in this area. Um, the drainage area uh, through here and, and the um, land cover in the, in the region um, is divided amongst agricultural, which makes up about a third, um, forested, which is about 56%, and then 10% urban uh, land. So our urban centers, obviously, are our cities, Stanton, Harrisonburg, um, uh, and Winchester up there, amongst others. So that's our geographic area that we're gonna be talking about. And then um, we're talking about stream restoration. And stream restoration is really a subset of ecological restoration. So it's a specific type of ecological restoration. So I'm gonna give you the, the definition here of, of stream restoration brought to us by the Society of Ecological Restoration. So the process of assisting in the recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, or destroyed. 
And so we're, we're looking at systems that have been degraded or damaged, say this lower right hand, um, restoring them. So here's a picture of, of Tom Benzing from James Madison University fishing a restored stream system here. Use this photo whenever I can, Tom. Um, and also for, for these guys, this is a stone fly here, which it sounds like we've had some discussions about invertebrates, and so that might be familiar to everybody um, that's been following along with this program. Um, and so we're trying to, to assist in their recovery. I think a good analogy for what restoration is, is doing is, is probably um, similar to what's done in medicine. So we're trying to take a patient, in this case our ecosystem, and kind of assist in the recovery of, of that patient um, so it can have these functions and these uses that we, that we care about as a, as a society. And we'll kind of touch, come back to this definition um, through the presentation. Okay, so there we go. And so streams of the valley. Um, this is a, a, a stream actually on a, a project site um, that my company is looking at uh, doing some work on. And I think a, a lot of folks, myself included, grew up around streams like this. I grew up in Floyd County, has agricultural history as well. And this doesn't look out of place. It doesn't look abnormal. There's nothing that is, is you know, identifiably wrong about it. If you grow up in this type of environment, it looks very um, just commonplace and what we'd expect to see. Um, and so it's, it, it can take some time, too, to, to start to look, dig a little deeper and understand some of the functions that might be lacking or what this uh, stream could potentially sustain. And so um, when we look at streams like uh, the one that I just showed there, um, and we look in the context of the, the Shenandoah Valley, we see that there are quite a few streams that are uh, considered to be impaired. And when I say impaired, this is all coming from the, um, the Clean Water Act, essentially. So after the heavily polluted Cuyahoga River in, in Ohio caught on fire, um, it ushered in some uh, federal legislation that resulted in the Clean Water Act. And what that set up was the state's responsibility to define water quality standards for different streams. This is obviously a very abbreviated history <laughs> lesson here of the legislation. Um, but that water quality standard, with that, it uh, came, came the responsibility of the states to assess uh, streams. And so we got both the water quality standards um, this assessment that occurs periodically to look at the health of our, our streams, and this idea of designated uses. So these are the uses that we all benefit from, from these resources. So things like fishing, things like swimming, um, even things like shipping um, and, and aquatic life. And so many of these in, in the valley are, are impaired waters uh, for bacteria. Which, which certainly makes some, some sense, and we'll get into some of the causes. Um, and also uh, the other significant um, cause of, of impairment of these assessed waters is, is from biological assessment. So looking at those um, invertebrates in the, in the stream and seeing that it's not supporting their life cycles. And so when we look at this, um, the number of impaired waters uh, we're looking at uh, just over 1,300 um, miles of impaired streams. And um, you can see the, the ones in red here have what are called a total maximum daily load that has been assigned to it. And that's thought of frequently and, and talked about as a pollution diet. And so again, kind of going back to um, our idea of a patient. So our patient can, can consume so much um, without it impairing their function. And then once it's past a, a certain amount, um, then it starts to um, actually uh, be considered to be impaired and, and we can't support aquatic life or can't support swimming, for example. Um, and so it gets set on, on this impaired waters list. And so we have 1,300 miles of, of impaired waters here. 
And um, we do have about 5,300 um, miles that don't have enough information to be assessed to. So many of those are likely uh, fully functional, uh, and then some of those likely do have an impairment. Uh, another important context for both stream restoration in this area and also just our water quality is that, of course, the Shenandoah River drains to the Potomac, and the Potomac then drains to the Chesapeake Bay. And the Chesapeake Bay is also considered to be impaired currently. Um, and so that has uh, an effect when we look at our local resources because um, some of the, the impairment is, is for both nutrients and sediment. And so when we look at our local waterways and, the tr and when they are transporting sediment or nutrients downstream, it does affect the uh, overall bay. So much of the work that's being done um, and that I'll be talking about is, is really based off of water quality and it's based off of both the water quality of our local streams and rivers and then also uh, the Chesapeake Bay. And so here's uh, a stream that is fully functional and healthy in, in the Shenandoah Valley. And one of the benefits of my job is that I get to go be around beautiful scenes like this and um, uh, get to see some of the streams that I don't think a lot of folks get to see, um, both, both ones that are impaired and, and offer opportunity for uh, restoration and also ones that are that are functioning well and are kind of the, the gems that we look out for. I really like this quote. It's, it's from Ellen Wall, um, who works at a, a Colorado State University. And, and in one of her books, she says, rivers exist in a rich and complicated context that reflects fluxes of matter and energy between the river and the greater environment, as well as the history of these fluxes. I think it's a great uh, concept and it, a couple of different things in here that I think are important to point out is that the river um, is always in interaction with the landscape adjacent to it. So it's always in interaction with that greater environment and there are transfers of, of energy. Um, so we're talking about uh, both hydrologically the rainwater that flows into the river, but also carbon um, that flows down rivers from the, the landscape. Um, and, and so there's this exchange between the two. And then I think very important and kind of jumping into it in the uh, next section is the history of these fluxes. We frequently look at streams and we look at them and we just make a judgment call, right? You know, it's good or it's bad and it's good because of this or it's bad because of this. Um, but there's a history there that informs our, both our understanding of that stream and also potentially um, how we might, uh, how we might uh, assist in that restoration of, of a stream should it, should it be um, warranted. So uh, something that I was inspired, or I kind of think because of this quote is, is that really the, the history um, and the story of a, of a river um, is really the story of its people, and to some extent, the story of the world. And this is a, may have been featured in some slides, I think, um, previously, but it's a, it's a great one, Dr. Ron Blakey. Um, and it's a, basically a look at North, North America, or at this time referred to as Laurentia, and, but showing kind of our, an overlay of, of our states here, so we can see Virginia right here, and this is about 400 million years ago. And you can see that it's, it's kind of in this light blue area. And so um, the reason that we're going back all this far is to start to understand, again, some of the context with, in which we're doing this restoration work, because it does inform how we go about uh, restoration, and it informs the, the resources that we have in, in the Shenandoah Valley as well. And so this shallow sea here deposited um, or because of the marine life that, that occurs in these shallow seas deposited, um, 
and is, and is the cause of a lot of the carbonate rocks that we have in the Shenandoah Valley. So when we think about the Shenandoah Valley, frequently people are uh, thinking of the limestone and also the springs and everything that we have. And part of the reason that we have that is because of this, um, is because of this in our history here. Um, and then uh, about 100 million uh, years later, um, in the Allegheny orogeny, that's what gave us the Blue Ridge Mountains was essentially another landmass called Gondwana slamming into this. I, think, I always think that plate tectonics could, um, could be like football or something or described that way, maybe, maybe not. Um, but that caused the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, to form. And so when we look at our soils, they're derived both from uh, these, these limestone and dolomite um, uh, underlays and then also the, the quartzite and uh, other minerals that have eroded over time. So we have really old mountains in Virginia. We have the Blue Ridge over here. Um, we have really old mountains and they've eroded uh, considerably <laughs> over the years. And that informs kind of the geology that we have in the, in the valley. So a lot of these um, purples and kind of maroons here are uh, these under, underlaying um, uh, dolomite and limestone formations. And then some of these are uh, more uh, s sandstone um, formations here. And you can see Massanut, and we can even see the landscape by just looking at the, at the geology. And so we have um, kind of the nature of these soils and the the nature of their erodibility, um, the, the weathering that has taken place, all informs essentially how the condition of our streams and, and the considerations that we need to think about if we're planning to um, uh, restore or bring back any of the, uh, of, of the functions, ecological functions that we care about. So um, here's a very old uh, map in the 1700s from from uh, called Michel's map, 1707. And I just wanted to show this, just we have a long history of agricultural, oops, agricultural development um, in the Shenandoah Valley and very important to Virginia, um, both agriculture and silviculture or forestry making up the, the largest um, part of our economy in Virginia. And so you can see here um, the cartographer made a point to put some of the livestock and, and other um, animals, uh, domesticated animals that were being raised in this environment. So we have, uh, and even prior to, um, to colonial um, sort of expansion to this area, as early as, as um, a thousand years ago, agriculture was being practiced by the Monacan tribes um, and others in, in this region. And we can see some of that in the soil records. And so you can see that they're actually on agriculture on a mass scale too, that would actually cause uh, erosion. And we can see, see some of that in, in bay uh, soil cores. And I find that really fascinating because you can start to, geology just seems like the ultimate detect you know, detective sort of story. Um, you can see all of this stuff into our history. And so, of course, to create these agricultural areas and um, to have the, the forestry that would follow, what are we doing? We're, we're clearing land. And so if we're clearing land, we're clearing that vegetation. And so that's going to have a fairly significant impact on our streams. So there's a concept in, in restoration and certainly uh, geology as well of, of legacy sediments. And so legacy, we're just talking about this historic deposition that has occurred uh, in our valleys. And this is coming from both the erosion from the, uh, the mountains that kind of hem us in and, and also these agricultural practices and forestry practices clearing the land, making that land more vulnerable to erosion, which then comes down into the valley. Additionally, um, for, 
at least since the 1600s, then there was a development of mill dams along many rivers in the Shenandoah Valley and, and elsewhere uh, in the mid-Atlantic. And these mill dams would, of course, dam up a stream and, and at the same time we're having this influx of erosion from uh, land clearing activities and that sediment would build up behind it. And so there's been some great research about um, that that I'll share in the next slide here. Um, this is specifically a picture of the South River and here is, I just think it's a, a great, a lot of times geologists go out to kind of road cuts to be able to see, um, you know, the history, the geologic history. And I tend to go to riverbank cuts and you can also get a sense of the history. So we can see um, historic wetland soils. We can see different alluvium um, that, has, that has deposited here. We can see even historic potentially historic stream bed gravels um, in these cross sections. And this also can inform the restoration approach that we, that we take. Um, and so I did want to mention uh, Jim Pizzuto from the University of Delaware had done some research uh, or has done lots of research on the South River. And part of his investigation was looking at the rates of erosion. A lot of times when we're looking at, when we're pointing our finger at erosion, we're saying, you know, the erosion is, is, is too much for the stream to process and for the uh, aquatic life that's in the stream. Well, what's the, what's the cause of that erosion? There's lots of different things that can contribute to that. And some of his research started to identify that these historic mill dams, once they're uh, breached or um, water ends up actually uh, flanking these mill dams, um, that that process and that built up sediment um, is, is actually what uh, accounts for the enhanced and, and the high rates of erosion that occur um, upstream. And so some uh, other research that was done by Walter and Meritz, um, and a lot of this in Pennsylvania, but you can see they, they were looking at the uh, mid-Atlantic um, investigating these streams that were influenced by mill dams and looking at those rates of erosion and uh, documenting the prevalence of mill dams. And so another thing that you can see if you look at, well, road signs or also USGS maps of the Shenandoah Valley is we see a lot of roads called, you know, Mill Road or Mill Creek Road. And well, these were, um, uh, there were quite a few uh, mill dams in the Shenandoah Valley all along the South River and, and others. Sometimes they, they become buried and difficult to, um, to identify anymore, but frequently they would, when they have built up the sediment um, behind them, then the, the stream starts to erode and become incised. Um, and then it can take, um, decades to centuries to erode away uh, a new floodplain and a new channel. And so this, this, this process, again, that we're looking at and we're trying to assist in the recovery of, of, this, of this ecosystem. So this is an important consideration for how we might think to restore streams. And here's our very own Mossy Creek in the Shenandoah Valley. And this was a dam, um, I don't believe it was a mill dam. I could be mistaken about that. But this was a fish and wildlife project on, on Mossy Creek um, where this dam was, re was removed um, and upstream stream restoration took place as well. So just a local example um, of, of this. And there's been several uh, dam removal projects in, in the area. Um, a lot of times both trying to address that upstream erosion, but also trying to address fish passage barriers. So bringing back um, fish that, that would use the, the channel for, for upstream spawning or that are um, anadromous or um, something, uh, fish like American eel, which are catadromous, which are, um, would actually go back to the Sargasso Sea to, to, um, uh, to breed, but uh, would come up into these these tributaries and and streams uh, for part of their life cycle, 
And so removing these impediments to that movement is a way to um, expand the range of, of these species. So kind of gone over some of the history, and, and so if we, I really like these, um, these diagrams from USGS because they, they kind of show a, a lot of, of potentially the, the different practices that might be influencing um, our, our streams given different things happening on the landscape. And so um, some of the practices that, that influence our streams and our stream health uh, in agricultural stream ecosystems include kind of farming practices, whether or not there are buffers or there are not buffers, um, whether or not there are um, uh, draining of, of different wetlands, um, whether or not there are direct discharges of, of, um, of agricultural runoff to the stream, whether or not we have cows in streams and so forth. Um, generally, these, these things start to influence the, the degree to which our streams can support aquatic life or are safe to, to swim in. As mentioned before, lots of the impaired streams that we have um, in the valley, but also elsewhere in the state are due to bacteria or E. coli. And now our, our urban stream ecosystem. So here we, we also see some of the sources of, uh, of impairments to our, our urban systems. Um, so we don't have the cow waste, but we have some pet waste. We have, um, again, we have different impediments or, or dams that might occur in our urban systems some of which might be hydroelectric, some of which might be more um, recreational or aesthetic even. Um, so a, a different suite of, of impacts that might affect how our streams are able to support um, aquatic life and the uses that we value or, or may not. And so we have impairments in the valley from both of these uh, kind of uh, these land covers and, and these ways in which our, our society and, and the way that we've built our environment and structured our environment ends up affecting um, our streams. And so then we have uh, natural, natural stream ecosystems. I um, want to digress somewhat because I remember a, a, a talk that I gave to um, actually Tom Benzing's class where I mentioned natural channel design and natural stream restoration. I do think that the term natural in itself ends up being a bit of a problem for our discipline because, well, what is, what is natural? We're trying to pinpoint something. Uh, well, nature is actually constantly changing. Um, nature is always um, in flux. And so what do we really mean by a natural stream uh, ecosystem? So if I could impart to you, I think a, a, a useful surrogate for natural would be balanced. And so when we're looking at a, a stream ecosystem, we're looking the degree to which it is actually balanced and in balance with its environment. We're interested in understanding whether or not the um, sediment input from upstream and from the, uh, the upstream watershed is in balance um, with the flow that's coming downstream, is it able to transport that flow um, or does it become embedded or accumulate within the stream system or do we see a excessive erosion? And so none of these things in themselves are evil or terrible, but it's the rates at which they occur. It has much more to do with whether or not it uh, pushes a system into what we call disequilibrium and so here in our natural or balanced stream ecosystem, we see the abundant life that um, can take part in, in the abundance that, that can occur and the production that can occur in a, in a stream ecosystem like this. We see um, you know, these, these different zones, our riparian zone of, of larger trees. We see probably wetland grasses along the fringes uh, and a lot of the different uh, life that that needs this balanced ecosystem to be supported. And jumping off from that, an early explorer, Alexander von Humboldt, after 
exploring the Americas, that everything is interaction and reciprocal. So I think that's a good takeaway for what we're looking for in our, uh, in our ecosystems as a sign of, of, of health. And so to summarize our, our discussion of the Shenandoah Valley and, and also stream systems, um, more generally, we have we have highly erodible soils. We have these um, soils that have been uh, deposited because of historic practices, our legacy sediments. We have our underlying underlying karst geology, which produces streams, but it also shows how connected the surface water is with the groundwater, and so that can contribute to um, potentially contamination of shallow aquifers as that water that is in runoff and the pollution that's in runoff can get into these areas that much easier. Um, we have removal of riparian forest, whether it's for agricultural purposes or if it's for, um, for urban development. Um, so again, we have that legacy sediments. Just want to really hammer home legacy sediments, apparently. We have agricultural runoff. We have, um, so that could be high nutrient loads or that could be from uh, cattle being in, in streams or being close enough to streams where they affect them. Um, we have alteration of streams like those dams, um, either uh, whether or not they're completely intact or not, hydroelectric or for uh, drinking water or for or historic. We have urban runoff and, and the different pol uh, pollutants that can come from urban runoff. And then we just have other conflicts um, that we didn't even really discuss, but I think we're all aware of when we go, when we, um, frequently are driving alongside uh, a, a stream. Well, we place roads and we place railroads and we place um, sewer utilities and other infrastructure in these same corridors. And so the stream is really competing for that space in that environment. And so we're in a management role and um, Historically, we, we kind of have a mixed record in terms of trying to, to manage nature, right? We've, we've taken, um, for example, outside of the stream aquatic ecology side of things, we've taken, say, this, this wolf that's very adapted to its environment, and we've changed it to this guy, which is super cute and, um, you know, has, it, has its own benefits. and. I'm not here to make judgments about, uh, but I don't believe this dog could last very long in the environment. But you can start to see how when we're in a management role, we frequently uh, influence natural systems because of our, our preferences or what we decide to care about. And so we decide to care about cuteness over survivability. Um, so the wolf can breathe very well. I think this dog, um, can't breathe too well. Um, so anyway, when we look at how we're going to um, manage these systems, we have to be very careful about uh, and, and considerate and thinking about what we decide to care about. Um, I really like this quote um, f from this paper, looking again at, at streams and how um, what sort of characteristics end up being restored for streams and the acknowledgement and understanding that it really is social forces that end up influencing the morphology of, of restored streams. And so we can't necessarily think that um, if we have a good understanding of science and we feel like we understand the history and everything that, um, that our preferences, our interests won't still influence this process. And now I'm gonna just try I think I'm doing pretty well on time here um, to describe to you my job and teach you how to do my job. Uh, so I'm an ecological engineer, um, and if we're in a management role and we're uh, involved in, in managing um, the conveyance of water, that's what a river is, right? A stream is just a conveyance system for water and we have rain falling on the mountains and we need to get it to the Chesapeake Bay. Well, I'm a smart engineer. I know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line and so I'm gonna draw a straight line between these two points and there we've got it, you know, 
see if I can go home yet. Well, we've got houses there and water doesn't actually flow along a two-dimensional surface. So I like pipes. Pipes are um, really simple. They're very simple to design. And so I'm gonna put a pipe in and that way, um, you know, these people don't have to worry about the nuisance of a, of a pipe or of a, uh, you know, flowing, flowing uh, water there. They don't have to see it. But unfortunately, rain, I guess, doesn't just fall on the mountains. It also falls elsewhere. And so uh, these people aren't too happy now. And so they're completely flooded out. So I need to go back to the drawing board. So I'll do an open channel. It's a little bit more complicated maybe, and these people are mostly dry, and, and maybe in a 30-year mortgage they get flooded out once or twice, but um, we won't worry about that. Um, so there we go. I think I've done it this time. I've figured out how to, to, to solve this problem of moving water, and now water that, uh, you know, rainwater that falls here will go into my nice concrete channel and you know that's what engineers have done for um, the last you know 50 plus years or so uh, more than that um, is design concrete channels we've done other things too um, but in terms of our water management what we cared about was getting water from one place to another we cared about flooding in particular too and so we were trying to move water quickly now there's unintended consequences of that, and uh, some of which are is the health of our, maybe not river, but concrete channel now, I guess, the health of our concrete channel. Um, but it also causes uh, other, other challenges as well in terms of um, downstream flooding, you know, in our Chesapeake Bay, and then our health of our Chesapeake Bay. And so when we're thinking about what we value, and how that might influence design. Um, now I'm gonna call myself an ecological engineer because I talk to biologists sometimes and maybe I care about this guy. This is a brook trout. And so how do I look at this system from the perspective of wanting to make sure this guy can live in my concrete channel? And so brook trout, um, they like these things, or my biologist friend told me that they like these things, and so now I'm gonna have to figure out what to do. So adequate base flow. Right now, in my concrete channel, water moves so fast, it rains, ends up in the bay. So that's great in terms of efficiency. Again, engineer, I'm thrilled. I've done this, my job so efficiently, but there's no real base flow. Um, so I've gotta figure out how to do base flow. But again, I'm pretty clever. So I'm gonna install a big sponge up here and it's gonna catch the rainwater and then it's just gonna trickle it into my concrete channel. So check, got the base flow covered, uh, but it's still pretty fast in there and so all my brook trout ended up in the bay and they don't tend to like the bay apparently. So uh, I gotta think about something else. I need to slow the water down more all right, so fine, I'll make some curves into it. I don't like curves, but I also have an architect friend, and so I told the architect friend to draw some curves because my ruler doesn't do, doesn't do curves. Um, but the, the water through here is still pretty warm, um, and so that's not uh, hitting our second one. We've got adequate base flow now, but not the second one. So I've got it. I'm gonna put some umbrellas along the riverbank, and you guys see where I'm going here. I won't belabor this too, too much here, but I do like, I spent so long on it in PowerPoint, I feel like I have to now. Um, we don't want it to be shady all the time necessarily though, and so sometimes we want it to retract, and so I'll get my mechanical engineering friend to come up with a way to mechanically retract my umbrella so we still let some sunlight in because some of the things that the brook trout likes to eat um, do need sunlight to grow. And, so um, now we need some silt free, this brook trout for real just has um, some very picky uh, place to call home. I don't, it's silt free, rocky stream bed now. All right, we'll put some rock in there. Needs some places to hang out apparently. So we need to put some places to hang out. And um, you've all guessed and you're all smart, smarter than engineers probably. And so we don't need to go through this, but we see that nature does all these things so much simpler and more elegantly 
and we have wetlands that are much more attractive than giant sponges. We have trees that allow sunlight in and also provide shade um, that are also um, better functioning and don't cost as much. This would have been a really expensive project, I think, um, to do. So nature seems to do a better job. And so here's a trout stream for a project that we're working on. Um, this is not in the Shenandoah Valley here, um, but the Cherokee National Forest. And here's uh, another trout stream that we worked on just over the mountain, still in Huntley, Virginia. And uh, I wanted to share this quote from you. I'm a little quote heavy, I guess, but quotes are fun, and then you don't have to take my word for everything. Um, and this is from Luna Leopold, which is Alda Leopold's son. Alda Leopold, you may know from the Sand County Almanac, um, and Luna Leopold, his son, was one of the um, kind of early pioneers of uh, fluvial geomorphology, which is the study of, of how, how streams um, flow over the Earth's surface, and, and really a, uh, the discipline from which a lot of restoration practices and restoration work gets done. But, he said, there's a balance or harmony in nat natural systems, which dictated by the laws of physics has gradually developed during the four billion years of Earth's history. So I think that um, really sums up what we need to be thinking about, is that we can look at a system and say we need to build in all of these uh, attributes that these different species need for their life cycles, need to be supported by. But if we look at nature and we look at the systems that over this four billion years um, have developed um, and how they work in concert with these different species and these species obviously adapted to these conditions over time and we can learn a lot for how, how we might um, improve um, our, our, our restoration techniques and, uh, and actually result in systems that can support, and streams and rivers that can support these different species. And so when we pay attention to what upstream looks like, uh, we start to get a little bit better. And so this is, again, that same project downstream of the stream that was uh, much more high functioning than where our stream was. Um, but we started to learn something. We we're trying to build in areas uh, for refugia for the trout to hang out in. We're trying to provide these rocky, silt-free um, riffles and stream bed. And as soon as these trees take off, we'll get the cover that we need to. And so now I just want to show some uh, a series of, of other pictures of projects that we have worked on that are in the Shenandoah Valley um, and how they are informed by these natural systems um, about studying them and, and, and also this history of the valley specifically informs how we go about restoring streams that are considered to be impaired because they're not supporting those, um, the aquatic life or they're not safe to swim in or, or fish from. So this is Mossy Creek. This is upstream, so upstream of any um, fishing that would take place, kind of the headwaters of Mossy Creek, but um, highly degraded system primarily impacted because of um, cattle farming there and uh, reduced riparian buffer, as you can see. Some, the buffer that was there was being eroded and falling into the stream. Um, and so this, this system was informed by this idea of, of removing uh, legacy sediments and creating a, a stream that is connected to its, its floodplain it tapped into several springs along its uh, reach, and so we get that influx of cold water. We make sure that we're um, using uh, equipment that's going to um, keep some of the soil structure intact that we're, of the soil, that, of the alluvium that we're not move, removing. We're gonna put a lot of wood back into the stream. And this was right after construction. A lot of the photos that I'll show you are right after construction, but I do have one much later, and you start to see that it, it, you know, nature is also fairly messy, but this is great. The water is much cooler. Um, there is not as much silt in, in the stream. Um, and we start to see this 
this recovery of, of the ecosystem. And we start to see the stream used to go dry actually in this section and um, by our, our monitoring that we've done, um, the base flow level does drop, but it, it still has base flow and particularly in the pools that were created, we still have cool water. Much larger scale now, moving to the South Fork Shenandoah River, a uh, river that restoration project that was funded by the state, both from this water quality perspective and trying to reduce the erosion that's sent, being sent downstream. Also from a fishing perspective, the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, now the Department of Wildlife Resources, and also um, the DuPont Settlement as well, looking to um, bring back some of the uh, functions and, and resources. Um, and so this is the South Fork Shenandoah River right around Elkton, Virginia. Um, this was actually, uh, again, rivers compete for space. And so this was actually a historic landfill. Um, and this is post restoration during some tree planting that we were doing. And so again, trying to use natural systems. I like showing pictures about the design process too, because I, I don't think I need to explain very much. It's almost intuitively, we can see the difference and see that um, it's, it's going to, to function in greater harmony with with the landscape. And so this uh, is a very large river. Um, so we show too that we can work on large rivers and, and shorter sections. What we might be able to accomplish in terms of water quality benefits does have a lot to do with the um, amount of area that we're looking at. And so this overall may not have a, a, um, a, a drastic impact, but we're keeping a lot of that landfill material now capped and out of, of the stream and by having um, these, these banks vegetated will resist a lot of the energy coming through. You can see, the, this is actually during a fairly large storm event, you can see how the energy is redirected towards the center of the channel. Have a little bit of technical difficulties there, but I'm sure you can see it. Um, and now, uh, Black's Run, and uh, just north of, or within Harrisonburg, but kind of the north end of, of Black's Run here, an area that was also impacted by, by cattle. Um, and so this was just after re restoration. So um, again, paying attention to um, kind of how the, the stream interacts with the bedrock outcrops and how we can uh, move a stream through uh, again, in greater harmony with the, the landscape, provide access to an overbank area for flooding events. Um, but we can also provide um, other things that we care about, like being in connection with the streams and rivers so that we have the ability to, to uh, create a greenway, a shared use path through here um, alongside our, our restored stream. And so this, um, we can accomplish these multiple um, uses, these multiple benefits in one project. Uh, similarly, the Edith J. Carrier Arboretum on JMU's campus, uh, a project so we can um, improve water quality uh, through these projects and also create a space for, for people to enjoy and take part in and start to develop a different concept of, of what these systems can look like. Um, and here's a project that worked with um, Trout Unlimited um, and, and Tom as well. And these are, these are Tom Benzing's photos here, but this was done for Habitat specifically, um, looking at pre-restoration conditions here. Notice the, uh, the walnut here. Um, and here we're trying to build in, and so this is embedding large woody material um, below the bank here, again, for refugia for, for, um, for fish in, in, this, in this river. Um, I think probably running, how much time do I have? Seven fifty. A couple of minutes. Yeah, this, uh, th this was just a, um, I don't know if it'll actually work here. Yeah, well, and so just this idea again of in balance. So this was a stream restoration project just after construction, getting a huge storm there. Um, and how do we see whether or not it's in balance? We see what changes these storms uh, produce on the landscapes. And so you can see right after 
restoration, we did get this really large sediment plume after that storm event. Um, the rest of the banks seem to be similar. Now rivers do sh shift um, across their floodplain. And so it was important for us to see kind of what happened here um, because what we're trying to do frequently is predict the movement and, and storage of sediment in these systems. And so, um, you know, this made me think, well, I really want this to be moving through um, the stream and able to transport that. And so then you see it, once we get vegetation in there, uh, unfortunately I don't have a, a video of it actually moving that sediment through, but now you can see that depositional storage as soon as the water droplet uh, moves here, that storage is on the floodplain and um, the finer sediment that would otherwise have an impact to aquatic life um, is now uh, being moved through the system or onto the flood floodplain. So that's some of what restoration seeks to do and, and seeks to um, uh, improve the, the water, both water quality for the Chesapeake Bay and our local streams and rivers and the aquatic life that needs these systems for, um, for their existence. Well, that's it. That's all I've got. Thank you so much for your time and, and uh, really appreciate being here and being able to speak with you. Okay. So we have time uh, for a, a couple of questions. Uh, if, if folks would like, I think Kip might stick around for some one-on-one -on -one as well. But if you have a question, please wait for the uh, microphone so people online can hear you. Would anyone like to uh, pose a question for Kip? Maybe I'll start with one real quick. Sure. Kip, that, uh, one of the early slides you showed, uh, if I remember right, it was 8,000 miles of stream within the Shenandoah Valley that uh, you were looking at. Is there like a minimum size that you include in that? You know, I know streams go from order one to 12, mm -hmm. one being the tiny little ones, 12 being like the Nile River or something like that, but the really tiny ones, is that, does that also include those? It doesn't include all of the headwaters. So th that was a, a, a figure coming from what the Department of Environmental Quality is, is actually looking at uh, assessing. So it does include those first order streams, those headwaters. Um, but likely is not including some of the more intermittent or ones that only flow seasonally. Um, and so, it, but it does, it, I mean, it's, it, that does include some of the smaller streams and some of the ones that I showed that we've done restoration on um, are included in that too, even though it's fairly a small drainage area size and still a first order system. Great, thank you. Uh, anybody else want to ask a question? I have one. Right, Jenna? about uh, career opportunities and the different kinds of jobs and careers that are involved in your company and the work you do. Thank Yeah, thank you very much. Um, something I did want to mention is, and, and when I was trying to kind of make fun of engineers there is, I, I am an engineer, but I wouldn't be able to do any of this um, without a team of, of scientists. So that every, everybody that I work with, environmental scientists, biologists, soil scientists, um, all have a, have a part in, in these projects. And really, um, I could not do anything without them. They would all be concrete ditches, right? You know? <laughs> um, so yeah, environmental scientists, um, uh, biologists, um, folks, folks that are, are um, experts in, in certain species of concern, um, you know, all have a place within the restoration field. And even a lot of these projects are also being done by uh, construction companies frequently that, that, that specialize in this type of work, um, at least a lot of the larger, more um, earth moving types of projects. So um, also, also everything from, you know, contractors and um, folks working construction and machinery and everything. Um, uh, we have sometimes fisheries biologists that are operators on, that are operating heavy machinery. So um, there's, there's a lot of people involved in this type of work. Okay, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I think what we're gonna do to end off the evening is we have a video produced by our tonight's sponsor, well actually the whole series sponsor, uh, the uh, South River Science Team. So I think we have that queued up.
brief introduction to it. So this video was put together by the South River Science team. They collected a bunch of uh, footage from several of us in the community, and you'll recognize some faces, I think. Um, and it's designed to just kind of give a little primer on what's going on regarding some of the mercury contamination of the river and the efforts like Kip was talking about to restore that. So we'll go ahead and let it play and then get talking. Exploration and navigation. We're all used to navigating roads, city blocks, even the internet. But have you ever charted your course through a watershed? Today we're going to explore the South River watershed in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. And to assist us, I've enlisted the help of our fishy friend, Southie, the mouthy South River fish. To be more specific, we're taking a deeper dive into the South River watershed. The South River is beautiful and serene as it winds its way up through the valley. However, there's more to its history than meets the eye. Human settlements, starting with indigenous populations, have been part of the South River story for 12,000 years. That's 12 millennia. Today, the watershed is widely known for outdoor recreation, and an abundance of nature. Some of the watershed is extremely rare and unique. Grassland prairies and sinkhole ponds provide ecosystems for plants, birds, and other types of wildlife. As the river flowed into more modern ages, it also became home to a robust succession of agricultural and industrial enterprises. Unfortunately, Industrial development also caused some problems, most notably the release of a chemical called mercury into the water, which is dangerous for both humans and the environment. From 1929 to 1950, mercury was used as part of rayon production at the former DuPont plant in Waynesboro. Some of the chemical was released into the watershed and found its way into the river environment. The South River Science Team has been working for 20 years to find solutions to mercury contamination, and now six riverbanks in Waynesboro have already completed the mercury remediation process. That's right, Southie. It is home to a lot of creatures. But mercury is only one part of the story of the South River and its watershed. This watershed, I hear tell, is full of fascinating treasures. Would you care to join us as we navigate and explore the South River? Let's talk to our friend Tom to better understand what a watershed is. I like to think about watersheds as land area. So even though the name contains water, it's really the land that dictates the watershed. It's the land that drains to that river. How we behave on the land, how we manage the land impacts that water quality. And that's the importance of watersheds realizing that there's a connection between the water that runs across that land area and what we see when we get to a point in the river. One interesting fact about the South River is that despite the word South in its name, the river actually flows in a northward direction, right up along the Shenandoah Valley. Southie, you seem lost. Are you looking for the source of the South River? Nancy can help us get oriented. You've got the, the village of Greenville, which is after Stanton. It's the oldest uh, platted or surveyed out community in Augusta County. And it was right on the Great Wagon Road, which is now today we know that as Route 11. The, the South River proper goes through there, but it arises a quarter of a mile away in a spring just on the west side of, of Greenville. And then on the other side of, of Greenville, on the east side, right up against the mountain, those cold springs obviously being the headwaters of part of the South River. Let's continue our navigation downstream to the city of Waynesboro, where we find a mix of old and new industries, recreational opportunities, and several very popular places to catch some fish. <laughs> Don't worry, Southie. You're not the only fish in the river down here, and being a trout, you'll love the cold water in the river right around Waynesboro. 
I've heard people say the cold water originates from an abundance of underground water springs. I think the most unique thing is the springs. Corner Springs, Baker Springs, Loth Springs. Um, Waynesboro is rich in springs. It is, to my knowledge, the largest spring creek that we have in Virginia, or at least spring influence creek. Our South River exploration is going to take us all the way through the communities of Dunes, Cremora, Harriston, the famous Grand Caverns near Grottoes, and eventually to Port Republic. All of these communities have unique histories involving the South River. Local high school teacher Tim has a clever concept that everyone has a watershed address. So watershed address, you find your closest stream or river and you begin going downhill. And you go downhill on your map until you can't go downhill anymore and you've reached the ocean. And so our, our watershed address would be standing here, South River, and then as it joins the Middle River, forms the South Fork of the Shenandoah, which then joins the Potomac, which then goes to the Chesapeake Bay, which then, of course, is uh, with the Atlantic Ocean. So that would be our uh, watershed address standing here at the edge of the South River. Just having a, a student map their watershed address and see the connectedness that they have to their downstream neighbors and that anything that happens in Waynesboro is going to show up in Grottoes, it's going to show up in Luray, it's going to show up in the Chesapeake Bay. And so those ideas of well, wait a second, what you do here does matter, it does. <laughs> well, Southie, you may want to stay right here where the water is nice and cold. As we've seen, there's a lot to explore in the South River watershed. To learn more about the mercury remediation, fish consumption advisory, or the Promotores de Salud program, visit southriversciencesteam.org. Hey, Tom, that was good. I, I heard that uh, they had to use a cardboard fish for the video after you caught the real one. Could you tell it was filmed during COVID? I had my little pigtail going on. I, I, I think that's it for the evening. Uh, I think Kip would be happy to stick around if there's any questions one-on-one -on -one you want to have a conversation with him. But let's join uh, everybody in thanking him one more time. <laughs>